uh, it's great to be in Boston. Love this town, love this city. I used to travel here extensively and haven't done so for a few years. So I'm grateful to the organizers to have me come and to be here in Boston, just love it. Um, one thing I always do at the beginning of a talk, how many of you, is this your first DevOps days? Oh my word. <laughs> you know what? That is really cool. I mean, just from my perspective, I'd say at least 75% of the hands went up. Is this the first, this is not the first DevOps days Boston, right? Uh, what are we, two years, three years, four years? Oh, eight years. Okay, well, okay, multi-year, okay. Well, this is my first, you know, DevOps Days Boston, but uh, as was mentioned, I did it, was able to attend the first DevOps Days in Santa Clara, uh, in the U.S., I should say. The first one actually was held in Ghent, wherever, uh, whatever, uh, Belgium, yes, thank you. Um, but, uh, you know, uh, it's just amazing. Every time I speak, I say, what, you know, is this your first time at an event like this, DevOps Days, uh, DevOps Enterprise Summit, whatever it is, and you know, at consistently, at least 50% of the hands go up. And we're, we're 10 years into this. You know, from that first DevOps conference, I'm going a little off track here, but from that first conference, right, we're, we're about 10 years in. And it's just amazing how this continues to grow. A lot of times, I think, for folks like me that have been in this a long time, we feel like this is getting kind of old, we feel like maybe we're in an echo chamber sometimes, but really, um, we're really just kind of still uh, what I'd call the early majority, right, uh, in this whole movement, and it continues to change uh, organizations. So today, I'm going to talk about really probably one of the, kind of one of the next uh, early uh, kind of adoption uh, within the DevOps community, and this is about SRE, or Site Reliability Engineering. And um, just a word about my company, um, Veracity Solutions, we're a tech consulting firm. Companies come to us when they want to transform, when they want to change, right? Digital transformation, that's kind of the buzzword of today. But we help with cloud adoption, we help with high-speed application development, we help with right, all those things that are going to help a company really uh, what we call uh, bridge this fourth industrial revolution, okay, that we are... Uh, currently experiencing. Um, you know, just I alluded to my DevOps journey. Um, this is just uh, some of the things that over the years I've been involved with. Um, I, w I became involved really um, with continuous delivery. Uh, I listened to a Jez, Tumble, Jez Humble speak and about continuous delivery. Um, the book had not been published yet, but I went, okay, that's what we need. Uh, at the time, I worked for Ancestry.com, and we began a, a rapid adoption of continuous delivery. Then, you know, DevOps, you know, came around, and so, you know, a lot of, a lot of cool things, um, you know, from that. One of the most uh, within my career and on this journey is I was able to start a conference with Jez, with Gene Kim, um, and others called Flowcon. We did that for two years. And then that conference was absorbed into Gene's DevOps Enterprise Summit, which is coming up here in about, oh, a month and a half in Vegas. Hope maybe we'll see some of you there. But um, just an awesome experience over the years. And uh, uh, DevOps, I've seen it change organizations. I've seen it, right, change not only the organization itself, but the people the satisfaction, uh, um, the the satisfaction with work, what 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 they're producing, and so uh, it, it's really it's really an amazing thing. Okay, so let's get on to the SRE. Just a little bit of history, uh, real quick. How many of you are maybe SREs or trying to do SRE or this is you know just some real practical experience? Okay, just really a few. So that's pretty consistent, and. Um, Really, SRE has been around a long time. It's just that we're kind of starting to become aware of it, really through uh, a lot through the DevOps. But it was really created in 2003. I mean, much, much before DevOps um, by, a guy, by a guy named Ben Trainer at Google. Okay, and he was tasked with uh, managing the Google site. 
And his job was, right, make this, make the Google site run, make it, you know, scale, we're growing, you know, all of that, we're, uh, make it reliable. And so over time, they put together a lot of practices that they ended up calling site reliability engineering. What I think was kind of a seminal time in this movement was in this period of about 2007 to 2015, um, a gentleman named Tom Limoncelli wrote a book, uh, wrote a couple of books, but really the one that I find really representative of site reliability engineering uh, concepts and practices is this called uh, Practice of Cloud System Administration. And uh, I, you know, in my uh, 10 years as a leader of data center operations, cloud operations, et cetera, I mean, this is the book that I hand uh, my ops folks, is please read this, please understand this. It's, it's a foundational text. Um, but as far as the public awareness about SRE, it really came through Netflix, okay? It was as Netflix began to come out with its rapid release, its you know, open source uh, projects, et cetera, is really where we started to hear a lot about site reliability engineering as far as right in the, in the public space. They would you know, start to talk about it at conferences, et cetera. So that's kind of the, the history. So it's been around a long time. But as you can see, right, very few people um, are doing it uh, yet. Um, the standard text I mentioned, if you want to really, you know, kind of, this is what I call like the canonical SRE, you know, set, the practice of cloud system administration. The Phoenix Project, right, hopefully everybody in this room has read that. If not, you really need to um, change your behavior, right? And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> No, I mean, the Phoenix Project is such a great, you know, um, uh, you know business fable, right? Um, that, that it illustrates a lot of the concepts, but, uh, you know, that we go through uh, and come, there's this function and things. Um, and then also additionally, Site Reliability Engineering and the Site Reliability Workbook. Newer texts, in fact, you can get the SRE book online for free at this URL, so. Okay, first. Um, what I want to talk about here really is principles, okay? And um, the first thing I'll say is, uh, if, if we think that we're going to implement site reliability engineering like Google does, or even like Netflix, um, you know, that's, uh, that's probably not gonna happen, okay? So really what, what, I, what I've tried to do here is distill the SRE practice down to some key principles. Because I feel like if we understand the principles, then we can adapt and implement those that, uh, as it makes sense within our own organizations. We're not going to have the same resources and the same ability, right, to, to do things as those companies in, all of, in, all, you know, in our own organizations. That was certainly the case in mine. But by understanding these key principles, uh, we can make them work in, in our own organizations. This is what I call the canonical or the standard SRE model. And the reason that I think this is important is there was a whole philosophy behind, you know, the SRE mindset. And it wasn't just about, oh, uh, let's call them site reliability. You know, it wasn't just a naming thing. Let's take ops people and call them SREs, right? No, um, it was about scalability, high reliability, operational quality, all of those things. But the real thing was a mindset that Google had and also Netflix had, which said the SRE really is about taking operational ownership of a product or a service, okay, and taking that ownership under certain conditions. And those conditions were conditions of quality. So what, what they said was we will manage the service, we will uh, take care of it in operations under the condition that development, that you will give us quality uh, code, that you will give us a quality service to manage. And if you do that, then we'll take that burden from you. Okay, so they, they interfaced, if you will, between that classical operation and the development group, right, to buffer, if you will, the development team from operational task, but under certain conditions. And you'll see that a little later when I talk about what's called the, the operational handback. 
or the production readiness review. You'll, you'll see kind of what's going on there. But it's a key point because many times, how many of you in operations have felt the victim of what development is producing and you're just forced to take it, right? Yes. I think, you know, uh, it's a very common thing. But that wasn't, uh, at least that wasn't the ideal, right, within the Google and uh, uh, Netflix implementations. Okay, so uh, let's go on. So practice or principle number one. One of the fundamental is you've really got to um, reorient toward a software engineering mindset. SREs, um, they don't necessarily, I mean, at Google, uh, honestly, or at Netflix, they hired software developers. That was their criteria. They would not, uh, you know, that, that was just, an SRE was a developer. Um, that's not completely practical. That's not practical for where, where I've been working. Even at Ancestry.com, which is a you know, pretty sizable organization, not really practical. However, it does set a principle in that there is a skill. There is a mindset that needs to be developed, right? And so what we tried to do was um, mix, if you will, some software development skill in with classical you know, sysadmin operational abilities. So, but you, the, the point here is that you need to begin to speak the language of the developer, right, in order to get really um, a good understanding of what's going on in the system. Um, you're not going to code that. They're not going to expect you to code that. But just what is going on, typical architectural patterns, right, um, are very important, OK? So that uh, creating that skill and that awareness, OK? Secondly, um, and this is what kind of my talk, uh, the title of my talk keyed off of, right, was this idea of toil. Um, you know, and toil is this, you know, it's just this drudgery, right? It's this work that you do over and over, repetitive, no real value add. I mean, it's value add, but it's, it's just, um, the, the idea is that uh, it's repetitive. Um, and, and really what you're looking for is you need to eliminate that, what's called toil, through automation. And so this is where the engineering, if you will, skill comes in is, how do we take this toil and then transform it into, uh, you know, in, uh, put automation around it and build automation and 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 reduce that repetitive work? Okay, so um, the the reason that's so important is because one of the fundamental ideas of SRE is to limit what's called the operational load or the toil load to fifty percent. So if you've got an SRE engineer, only half of his time should be spent doing, you know, that kind of manual work, that, uh, uh, you know, managing systems and, and, and that. The other half of their time needs to be spent eliminating toil, which fundamentally means automating, writing code, um, uh, and, 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 and doing that type of work. The, the, the key idea within SRE is that if that toil load gets over that 50% threshold, you are now in what's called this kind of engineering bankruptcy. You're, you're on the way to uh, a kind of a bankrupt state where you really can't keep up. Um, the idea, too, is that with SRE practices that you will be able to scale uh, sublinearly. In other words, that as your, the number of your servers and your infrastructure and, and your, your application grows, um, that you won't have to scale your uh, people linearly, right? Like if I double my servers, do I have to double the number of people? That would be considered a failure from an SRE mindset. I want to be able to scale 10x, right, with just an incremental growth in people. So um, you... you you have to keep the toil manageable so that you have capacity to continue to improve. Okay, the other one, uh, which this was something that uh, I didn't, um, you know, uh, understand till really later uh, in some SRE implementations, but is to really understand the difference between SLIs, SLOs, and SLAs. And you say, ah, oh, well, I'm, I, you know, I was just used to SLAs. But within the SRE um, mindset and principles, 
there's initially they divided into really down to these three areas. First of all, service level indicator meeting some kind of a measurement or an indicator about what it is that I'm, uh, you know, monitoring. Um, and then those SLIs that I'm measuring will inform what I call, what we call a service level objective. In other words, what is the threshold that we will allow for this particular indicator? It could be an uptime metric. It could be a throughput or a performance metric. Um, but then the SLOs really is what is, is what's being um, focused on or targeted within the engineering organization. And then those SLOs inform service level agreements, which are then business uh, level um, agreements. They're, 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 they're agreements that are made between customer and business. Okay? So uh, a, very, a very key distinction, your SLA may not be as rigorous as the SLO, for instance. So uh, a key distinction between uh, those three. So, you know, as I mentioned, SLIs drive the SLOs, which then inform uh, SLAs. Okay, um, number five, use and adapt to error budgets. This is a very clever, um, I think, construct within the SRE discipline. Um, the, there's always this tension, right, between, um, I guess, uh, failure, perfection, but also moving quickly, right? Um, you'll, also, you'll see this a lot of times within, you know, um, what do we do about quality? Do we sacrifice on quality to go faster? You know, um, and what the, what the idea was here with error budgets was that, um, number one, the recognition that, Really, 100% perfection is not possible. You have to acknowledge that there will be some failure. Secondly, um, acknowledging that there will be some failure, then what do you do? Um, how do you use that to your advantage? And so what was developed was that there's a certain tolerance, right? I can have in this error budget. Maybe I can afford some, you know, 1% or a 0.5 or a 0.1% type failure. Well, um, if the team, if the development team that, that's responsible for this service is shipping this and they're doing very well, then maybe they can afford to go a little faster and sacrifice a little bit of that budget toward um, moving qu more quickly, maybe sacrificing a little bit of quality. Um, however, if things aren't going so well, then it's incumbent upon the team to slow down and get back within uh, that error budget. And so this gives the team the flexibility as long as they're within this error budget that they can um, move more quickly, maybe uh, sacrifice a little bit of quality, right, as long as they stay within these bounds. This is a very difficult te thing for teams sometimes to really and it, uh, to accept and it also takes a mature organization to really be okay with letting somebody actually incur uh, you know, some failure, um, maybe even intentionally, uh, if you will. So um, kind of, this is one of the more mature, uh, I think, practices within an SRE implementation. Something that probably would come a little later, right, in an implementation. Um, practice number six, I uh, mentioned this earlier. I think personally, this is probably one of the most useful and powerful techniques uh, within the SRE discipline. And I mentioned earlier, it really revolves around the quality. It's, it was designed, again, that the SRE team said, look, development team, we know you don't want to get burdened and bogged down in operational details. We will relieve you from those details, right? A lot of people think that DevOps means that, you know, that, that means uh, developers doing operations. That's not right what it means. Um, it means really that both of those groups work together. That's at the core of DevOps, what that means. But some people have taken that to an extreme and say, well, I don't need operations people. I can just do that myself. And um, really what the SRE said was, we'll do it because there are a lot of things and there are a lot of specialty there um, that we can take from you, but we have to be able to know that what you're giving us, uh, that we can operate effectively. And so what, what they do then is 
At a certain point when it's perhaps going to go into production, they'll do what's called a production readiness review. And they'll say, analyze, is it, you know, what's the quality, you know, bugs, uh, other issues, how, how long has it uh, been under test, have you been running it in kind of a, a dark environment for a while, whatever, whatever the process is, right, to make sure that there's a confidence in the quality and that when it's handed over into the SRE group, that they can actually uh, run it. They're not, they're not going to get inundated with uh, pages or, well, that's old, right? Um, uh, uh, alerts or, you know, alarms, okay? And so um, they go through that process. Now, um, if at some point in the life cycle of the service, things begin to go bad, what happens? Are you stuck with it? The SREs just have to deal with it? They beg, please, please, please. Um, no, what they can do is what's called an operational handback, or right, where they actually, and I, uh, and when I was at my last company, um, one of the first things I did with my operations group was we instituted this, and this was the single thing that drove quality, uh, that accelerated the adoption of quality because uh, the team was fighting against operational issues, development was really lacks on fixing, uh, fixing them, right, took time. And I just said, okay, we're gonna begin doing operational hand back. I would pull in the leads, the development leads and say, we're gonna, we're gonna work together on this, right? And you need to stop uh, producing new features while we get this under control. Um, wasn't quite that simple, but you know, it was a little, we took some political finesse, I guess, to get that uh, working, but um, but it began to drive the importance of that operational quality up within the organization, a very effective technique. Number seven, right? <laughs> blameless post-incident reviews. I think we all understand the value of a post-incident review going through what happened after something you know, didn't go right, the, the learnings that come from that. The, the key here is really the blameless part, and that is, can you conduct a review where you don't admit your mind or the organization doesn't immediately go and say, oh, it was that person's fault. Uh, we all do it. Uh, we all look for that it was a person. The problem with that is that if the organization knows that that's where people's minds are, people aren't going to be forthcoming. They're not going to really be open about what's, work what's not working or what, what happened. Um, this took some time to really build into the culture and it really took some explicit, you know, rules about when we went into postmortems about we're not going to, um, you know, point fingers, we're not going to mention names. I mean, it had to be pretty, ex uh, pretty um, extreme, right, if you will, on one side to kind of get this going. But what happened eventually I thought was amazing. And that is once people felt safe, you actually saw people say, you know what? I could have done better. I missed that. I should have checked that before I did, you know, X. And that I thought was the, the greatest thing that came out of it was we didn't have to point fingers. People were taking responsibility and accepting accountability for the things that they, they knew they should have done but didn't do. So um, a very powerful, again, uh, construct. Um, this, in organi organizing SRE, a lot of people ask me, how do I organize this within my company? And I found that this is probably the best uh, organizational is to have like a core SRE team um, that kind of, that, that governs the standards and the, uh, you know, how things work within the SRE, uh, you know, how do we automate, what do we use to automate, just it, it kind of centralizes all that into one group. But then taking individual SREs and then embedding them out into the organization, into development teams, maybe one, two, three teams they may have responsible for, uh, you know, it just kind of depends on the team, maybe the size of the team or the, or the uh, importance in, within the organization of that product. But um, having this core uh, that centralizes certain things and then having um, embedded SREs out uh, into the organization helping uh, engineering and development teams. Lastly, um, and I hope you, I mentioned this in the beginning, but really is you've got to make the SRE discipline your own. 
You can't create a Google SRE. You can't create a Netflix SRE. You have to create your company's version of an SRE. But you also need to take into account some of these key principles and facts or else you kind of don't really have the idea of SRE either. So it's an implementation um, where you take these key concepts and principles and then adapt it into your organization to fulfill um, really what I find is an exceptional value to the organization in that of site reliability engineering. Thank you.